plastic soup of the North Pacific Gyre. There's the soup. We predict all these things, and then when you see it come true, it's shocking. It's still shocking, even though it's been predicted. Here is the uh, average plastic content in the stomach of a bird. If you translate that to a human body size, this would be the average in uh, the stomach. So, in the past five minutes here in the Compton Creek, I took a little walk around to see how many styrofoam cups I could pick up in five minutes. What you see here is what six people would consume in one week of drinking coffee every day. So many people think that their individual actions don't really have an impact. But if you multiply this by the millions and millions of people that drink coffee in Los Angeles alone, you can start to understand how we see something like this in every single river, every single creek, every st single stream in Los Angeles. Behind me is Compton Creek. It's one of the many streams that drains the Los Angeles area. Now this stream will go into the Los Angeles River and then out to the Pacific Ocean. The purpose of this boat is to, to get attention and get politicians, get other school teachers, get the public to look at us and listen to our story. Listening to Marcus and Anna's story is like being immersed in the planet's seas and taking the time to look. In the Mediterranean alone, there are three million tons of garbage drifting around and 80% of it is plastic. We don't think about it, but the seabed wasn't always covered with these often unidentifiable drifting objects. We're only the third generation to make massive use of plastics. All this is the result of 60 years of consumption. We've let plastic colonize the sea. On the surface, a few meters down, and at a depth of 1,000 meters. This material will be down here for ages, especially where it's really deep, because there's much less oxygen and no light whatsoever. Those are factors that help to break down the plastic, so this stuff will be around for a few hundred years. You kind of lose your dreams. When you go down very deep to 1,000 meters, say, you imagine something mysterious and completely different. So when you get down there and you see piles of rubbish and plastic, it's just awful. And there's just so much of it. The oceans are being stuffed with plastic. We're force-feeding them. But there's something we haven't thought of. They can't digest it. The nets are full, but there's nothing miraculous about the catch. This material has revolutionized our lives today. But at what price? What happens to plastic once it's in the ocean? Is it really inert, as we've always been told? Does it really have no effects on animals or humans? Michel Loubry is one of the thinking heads of a professional syndicate. Once you are in and you realize all the benefits that this plastic material is bringing to the society, to the quality of life, you are convinced that plastic is fantastic and then you want to explain that to everybody to prove that this product is not dangerous at all and is providing quite a lot of marvelous things. If plastic would not be existing, the resources for the planet, the wood, the steel, aluminium, everything, that planet we live on would be totally exhausted. Thanks to the plastic which has been invented industrially speaking in the 50s, we have been able to produce so much 
material, so much products that we use every day. So I just came back from a, a, a drive out to the desert to one of the aircraft boneyards where we picked up this Cessna for a few hundred bucks. Now it's missing the wings, it's missing the engine and everything else except for the fuselage. This is ideal because it's lightweight, it has the doors intact, the windows are intact, waterproof, but we'll make it waterproof. Marcus Ericsson is a dedicated militant against plastic. For 15 years he's been paddling along America's rivers. He's seen the pollution grow, and it keeps growing. One day, Marcus had a dream that the whole world would care about the problem. He hopes to mobilize the planet by sailing the seas in an old airplane cabin sitting on 15,000 plastic bottles. Get ready. One, two, three. With the energy of someone who's determined to change the world, he's setting out for a 2,500 mile trip on the open ocean. So this is over a thousand people, school kids, people from across the country, from Chicago, have given us messages about the ocean and about plastics, which we're going to take across the ocean and bring back and share with uh, policymakers and try and get something done about this plastics issue. That's our message in a bottle. This is the Marine Mammal Center, one of the biggest organizations of its kind in the world. For 35 years, a thousand volunteers have constantly surveyed the beaches and waters of the entire California coast to help undernourished or sick animals. Over the years, they have had to learn to deal with new kinds of wounds. There definitely is an increase of animals admitted to our facility with the entanglements. We have some um, fishing line uh, that was attached to a hook that came out of an elephant seal's stomach. We have a uh, thick black band that was wrapped around a sea lion's neck. We have um, some monofilament line that was wrapped around a sea lion's neck as well and inside of its mouth. And then we have a balloon strap and string that was found wrapped around a Guadalupe fur seal that's actually an endangered species. So it's very much of a concern. Lost nets don't stop fishing. There have been cases of strangulation in half of the species of seals and sea lions. Eighty species of whales have suffered an incidence with plastic. Plastic can maim and kill, and also suffocate. Although the volunteers of the Marine Mammal Center manage to save dozens of animals every year, the vast majority are inaccessible. But we can see that it's fairly deep. The biggest problem with something like this is this animal, whether male or female, she's going to grow some more. And that entanglement won't. And after a while, it could end up strangling her or stop her from being able to eat. Four out of five plastic items found in the sea come from what we throw away on land. Here are some of the first collateral victims. 300 marine species are victims of plastic. Twenty years ago, Jan van Franeker, a Dutch seabird specialist, started an experiment on fulmars, a common species in northern Europe. He wanted to know what they ate. A completely straightforward investigation. But its results were a big surprise. 
uh, I, I look at fulmus and plastic more or less by uh, accident because in the early 1980s I found more plastics and at that time stuff I didn't know at all in, in the stomachs which later proved to be uh, industrial plastics. Well, the, the first time I realized it was plastic in a bird's stomach, it was uh, uh, amazement. Jan has alerted his European colleagues. He is determined to know how many fulmars are affected. He has received and analyzed 3,000 birds found beached along the coastline of eight countries. There's a piece of uh, nylon wire, this green bit. There's pieces of plastic uh, bag, still wet and, and dirty. 95% of these birds foil. are flying dustbins. There's all sorts of uh, fragments of uh, broken up plastic items. And here there's uh, well, at least seven industrial uh, plastic granules. Okay, wh what I have here is the average plastic content of a fulmar in the southern North Sea. So if you translate that to a human size, th this is what be the average in the stomach. And so in that case, there's no need to discuss whether it's good or bad for you. We agree that this is not healthy. According to the United Nations, plastic is now part of the diet of half the species of seabirds. Thanks to the use of plastics, we protect the planet and we protect the climate evolution as well. If you would have to replace the plastic packaging by other material, then you would have to multiply the, the weight of the packaging by four, the price of the packaging by two, and the amount of waste by 1.6. Drifting plastic. Marcus and his friend Joe are sailing the mid-Pacific, sitting on thousands of slightly leaky bottles. Marcus's plan has already worked. His exploit is being followed by millions of people on the internet. It can affect some policy. Some policy to help curb the exploitation of these synthetic chemicals that we have used to our advantage, short-term advantage, but now we're finding are just polluting our world. And really, I can feel that it's going to impact the next generation. My kids are going to feel it. So I feel, like, obligated to do something. It's an obligation. Knowing something's wrong, you can't do nothing, otherwise you're an you're accomplice. In the 1920s, an English peer had an outlandish but particularly far-sighted idea. He fitted a number of ships, which regularly followed the same North European shipping lanes with a strange device. It was a recorder. Ships have been towing them every month ever since. These are time machines to be kept as treasures. The recorders contain cassettes with which you can trace the evolution of plankton in the English Channel and North Atlantic. 170,000 samples of plankton that has been trapped over 5 million miles, a spider's web woven over almost 100 years. These devices have provided some unexpected and precious scientific proof. It occurred to us that, well, if it's catching planktonic organisms, maybe it's catching small pieces of plastic at the same time. So we went back through 
historic samples we sampled from the 1960s, the 1970s, the 80s and the 90s and then compared abundance through time and that's where we showed that it had increased significantly when you compare the 1960s and 90s. This British scientist has proof of the increasing pollution of the Channel and the Atlantic. In fact, plastic never decomposes into the environment. It just breaks down into smaller bits over time. So even if we stopped producing plastics tomorrow, which is not something that I would advocate, because I actually think plastics can bring many benefits to society, but even if we did, the legacy of the plastics that we've produced, their fragmentation would continue for many decades and centuries to come. Marcus wants to share this scientific discovery. All the plastic which has ended up in the sea is still there. Three months and several storms later, he finally reaches Hawaii on his plastic bottle raft. It was enough to make him a hero of modern times. His struggle is starting to get some attention. steady trend of increasing plastic and it's growing exponentially. So the purpose of this is to get the world's awareness then talk about solutions. What do we do about this issue? While Marcus is busy consciousness raising, on the other side of the planet, Richard Thompson is busy collecting scientific evidence of the contamination of the marine habitat by plastics. I was just interested, well, these are plastics that are forming by the breakdown of large pieces. Well, what is the smallest piece of plastic present on the beach? That was the challenge I set to two of my graduate students just a little bit over 10 years ago. Richard has found fragments of plastic that can be measured in microns, finer than a human hair. And he has found huge quantities of them. Of all of the pieces that we we extract that look a little bit unusual, around about a third we confirm to be plastic. He thought that maybe his findings were the result of a freak event on a particular Plymouth beach. So he analyzed the sand of 10 other British beaches. Then he checked all studies of the same type worldwide. We found these materials every place we've examined and that surprised me the ubiquity the fact that these we know that large items of debris are now covering the ocean surface they're down in the deep sea bed but the fact that beaches worldwide are now contaminated with small fragments of plastic w was actually quite surprising to me i expected that maybe as we moved to more remote places then perhaps we wouldn't find any plastics at this this microscopic scale but in fact we have People are thinking that plastics are polluting. It's because they are totally ignoring the enormous amount of uh, uh, benefits, uh, benefits that you get from the plastic material. Lightness, less consumption, etc. If you uh, have light, lighter vehicles, then automatically the consumption is, very, uh, is lower. Uh, 100 kilo less for a car is 0.3 liter uh, per 100 kilometer. Captain Charles Moore is fed up with seeing the oceans used as a dumping ground. He traces the effluvia of plastic back to their origins. At birth, before becoming a bottle, 
bag or blister pack, plastic comes from petrol. Then it is delivered to manufacturers in the form of little pellets. This is all plastic pellets. They come out of this valves right here. They come out of here, they spill on the ground, and after many years, millions, millions and millions. They call them mermaid's tears. Without having been used for anything, these pellets are on their way to the watercourses. This facility is still releasing millions every time it rains. So this is an illegal dump of pellets, pre-production plastic pellets. This is a bag factory. These are polyethylene pellets. They float in fresh water. These are the pellets from the rail cars that have been washed and blown down to the drain. This is the drain that leads to the river. These millions of pellets are entering the ocean through those little holes right there. You can see pellets on every side of the drain. We found 236 million of them in three days of sampling these rivers, coming down the rivers to the sea. Just in three days, 236 million pellets. Charles Moore is infuriated by plastic waste because he also knows that it never disappears. The captain's life changed 12 years ago when he sailed a little used route across the Pacific. Every time I took the time to survey the ocean, I was able to see something in it. I even would make a bet with myself. I will come out now, I will survey the ocean and see nothing. But I would lose the bet. I would always see something. And this gradually made me think something's wrong here. When he returned, he was intrigued that there was so much plastic floating around so far from civilization. So he decided to go back and quantify the problem. This was the big shock, and this was a very, very big surprise. We were shocked when we pulled up the net for the first time. I mean, that was an aha moment. My goodness, what have we done that we can just throw a net anywhere in the ocean and pull this kind of plastic debris out? Hi, Dr. Marcus here. I'm high above the Pacific Ocean in the middle of nowhere looking for plastic and lots of it. Captain Charles Moore created a foundation called Algalita. Marcus, the activist, joined him along with a considerable team. They have obtained government grants to study this area. Since then, they have kept on filtering the ocean. The situation will surely change if they were to find themselves in it. Supporters of the H bomb, couple of one health and clinics. It's only when there's open time. It's like a little bottle cap. So this is seven hours on the open ocean with a, a trawl. It's about as wide as a lawnmower. That's not much area. That's like an inch long human hair on an entire football field. The ocean is so vast, but this much plastic on a very small strip that we sampled using our trawl. Captain Moore's samples have stirred up a planet-wide controversy. He discovered the trash vortex and told the world about it. Trash from the American continent is sucked into the trash vortex by spiraling currents of the North Pacific, joining the trash coming from Asia. Some of the islands and beaches of Hawaii are in the direct line of fire for this mass of plastic. The archipelago is the victim of throwaways from all the countries that border the Pacific. We began cleaning this, this coastline here in 2003 and uh, since that time we've collected over 90 tons of trash just off this few miles of coastline. The trash drifts with the major ocean currents, spiraling round for at least 10 years and finally ending up as a stagnant mass in a central zone whose size is still unknown.
Charles Moore's team has established an operating procedure. Samples are brought back to land to be studied. Expedition after expedition, the extent of the problem is revealed more clearly. From 671 fish that we collected of six different species, over 35% of them had at least one piece of plastic in their stomach. And, and the reason we want to care about this, um, although these fish might be ugly to some people, I think they're adorable. And they're also the main food source for animals such as tuna and mahi-mahi and salmon. People don't necessarily eat these fish, people eat the fish that feed on these fish. So it brought about a whole bunch of more questions and how eventually is this gonna affect humans down the line? In the middle of the trash vortex, as far as is possible from any inhabited land, Charles Moore and his team have discovered even the simplest forms of life struggling to survive in the midst of our trash. Jellyfish so tangled up, they can no longer swim. Even the zooplankton, the most basic element of the ocean food chain, are affected. These tiny living organisms swallow tiny particles of plastic which get stuck and become embedded in their bodies. Microscopic life forms, but life forms that are already struggling for survival as they become further and further enmeshed in our rubbish. Thing that's most shocking to me is of all the samples we've taken, whether they be at the surface, 10 meters, 30 meters, or down at 100 meters, every single sample has had plastic in it. From the samples we found in 1999, there was a ratio of 6 to 1 plastic to plankton. Uh, now, in 2008, we found a plastic plankton ratio of 46 to 1, so that's over eight times as much plastic in the environment. We predict all these things, and then when you see it come true, it's shocking. It's still shocking, even though it's been predicted. The plastic soup of the North Pacific Gyre. There's the soup. Scientists have shown that there is no untouched zone left on this planet. Every square mile of ocean contains tens of thousands of bits of plastic. The result of our consumption. 220 pounds a year per inhabitant. We will not change the uh, evolution of the society. We are using less and less time to prepare the food uh, for the lunch or for the dinner. Uh, and as well, uh, uh, we um, move and we have the habit to eat outside of the house. So more and more we will use products which are much more packaged and ready to be consumed for the drinks or for the food than uh, we were used to use in the past. In the, in the first 10 years of the current century, since 2000, we've produced as much plastic as we produced in the entire century that preceded. We're using at the moment in excess of 260 million tonnes of plastic every year worldwide. Now around about a third of that is used for single-use items, for items of packaging that are used once and then discarded. So it's a material that lasts for a very long time in the marine environment, and yet we use it and throw it away within a year. Are these oceans of plastic there because of our carelessness? Or is it because the system doesn't work properly? What happens to plastic when we've thrown it away? This is one of the biggest garbage tips in the United States. Pony Hills Landfill serves half of Los Angeles County, about 78 cities and 5.2 million people. The Pony Hills Landfill takes in and is permitted about 13,200 tons per day. Uh, what that accounts for is if you take a football field from post to post, fill it up with waste about 10 feet high or a little over 3 meters, that's how much waste is accepted here a day. 
In the United States and Europe, at least half the plastic that we throw away is simply buried. Thousands of bottles and bags end up in this type of tip every year. Between them, the two continents buried 45 million metric tons of plastic in 2007. In the face of this exponential consumption, the infrastructures can't keep up. Only 5% of the plastic used in the world is recycled. And the West, the main consumer, does not even have the means to deal with that. This is the port of Chennai in India. Part of our recycled waste ends up here by the container full. Hidden from European eyes, our rubbish is treated behind these doors, which are usually kept closed. The sea containers are then unloaded and then the material is stocked in this yard. In this yard, as you can see, there is different, different qualities from different origins. Some material from Germany, some from France, some from America, some from the Middle East. It's this and man, Sanil, in, who let us in to Futura. India's number one recycler of plastic bottles. Sanil is a broker. He buys the contents of our recycling bins and resells it here, where it can be treated by cheaper labor. Sanil's line of business is doing well. The export of used plastic has been increasing by 30% a year. In 2007, France sent 700,000 metric tons of plastic abroad. As you see, these bales are from France. If you see from the labels, you may be able to identify the bottles that maybe you have used and sent away in the garbage bin. These have come here now and they will be recycled and made again into valuable bottles or more products which could be used again. Half of the plastic recycled by Futura comes from Western countries, quite legally. The recyclers hope that by showing us how well they take care of our rubbish, they'll encourage us European consumers to send even more. The message to the European customers, or European homeowners, or European men and women, is very straight and simple. Futura Polyesters is proud to be associated in keeping the environmental clean and good for the human to live forever. We collect those bottles which you throw in the dustbin and convert them into those products that you use every day. Maybe it is a shirt, it is a t-shirt or it is a pantan shirt or it is the bottles which you use for drinking water or any drinks or any juices. So we try to have zero waste if possible. We like try to have no uh, plastic come into our homes and then end up in the garbage can. So Marcus and Marcus Anna have gone for a radical solution. And forks. But when we go to buy things at the grocery store, like we buy bread, it sometimes comes in a plastic bag, so you have to find, you have to go to an actual bakery. We are now making these out of old t-shirts. So we've been collecting t-shirts from schools and from Goodwill when people are throwing away their shirts instead of using plastic bags. And of course, we never buy plastic water bottles. Anytime we want to get water, we bring our own. We fill up at a tap, filtered water. We bring these with us everywhere. So you get these habits, you develop them, and then you don't think about them. You just remember, grab my bag when I go to the market. Even organic waste doesn't go into plastic bags. It gets eaten. I'll show you guys the worms, let's see. Oh yeah, you gotta see underneath. Careful, they're gonna fall out. And, and look on the bottom. And look, some shallots, some garlic. 
So this is our recycling bin. We try not to throw anything away. If we buy something, we try to make sure the packaging is recyclable. The idea of waste is something completely invented by humans. So there should be no waste if you're recycling, if you're conscious about the things that you buy, and you remember that everything you buy has to go somewhere. No plastic in the home equals no plastic in the tip or going abroad, plus no plastic in the ocean. That's Marcus and Anna's equation. They're tireless. They're already off on another adventure, pedaling 2,000 miles between Vancouver and Tijuana to convince whoever they meet on the way. For them, plastic is a problem full stop and it needs to be eradicated at the source. The benefits which are brought by the use of the plastic material are so great for the society, so great for the consumers in terms of security for food, in terms of lightness for transport, etc. That it would be stupid just to cancel those very strong benefits in order to just uh, correct something which is just at the end of the life of the product and because there is a wrong behavior of the people and of the society. We hear that same line from the weapons manufacturers. Guns don't kill people, keep people kill people. Um, we hear the same line from the plastics industry, that plastics aren't the problem, it's people that are the problem, it's people littering. But there's no way to educate every single person on the planet to uh, dispose of their plastics properly. So the industry and the manufacturers have a responsibility to design a product that if people litter, if a plastic bag blows out of a garbage truck, it won't have the sort of impacts that we're seeing. Can we do without plastic? For the moment, the answer is no. But in Europe, a few municipalities are trying, at least in part. The coastal town of Lorient found itself faced with a problem of plastic pollution early on. Pollution of its beaches and the sea. So 10 years ago, it made some changes. Well, it's bread, vegetables, a bit of everything. And in the summer months, there's lots of stuff from their gardens. Things like flowers, grass from their lawns, that sort of thing. It's whatever people happen to have at home that's biodegradable. For the moment, these bags are one of the few alternatives to plastic. Organic waste is collected every week in bags made of starch. They don't have to be sorted. The bags break down naturally along with the food waste. The biodegradable bags are mixed with the organic waste, so they break down completely within three or four weeks. The potato and cornstarch that they're made of reacts like any other organic matter, just like potato peelings, for example. The resulting compost is used by the region's farmers. So two million organic bags go back to the earth each year and a bit more plastic has not ended up strewn around or in the sea. bottles and make this boat. We successfully sailed to Hawaii to get attention to the issue of plastic marine debris. What's washing down our coast... Hundreds of school and college students attend Marcus and Anna's lectures all along their trip from Canada to Mexico. Now you might think, okay, this animal, it eats plastic, it goes in the mouth, out the other end, and that's it, no big deal. The problem is, other end is small, so this plastic, these plastic particles they actually stay in their stomach for a long time. The plastic, these plastic particles, they're not benign. They, they don't just sit there and do nothing. And Marcus raises another question. The industry adds millions of tons of chemicals to plastics. What kind of effects do they have? Next 
These freshwater snails are sensitive to the slightest variations in their environment. They serve as sentinels. One day, the Federal Agency for the Environment asked Jörg Ullmann to study the effects on this gastropod of a chemical substance whose effects are still unknown, bisphenol A. He was surprised, but went ahead. It was a complete new phenomenon for us. We had analyzed thousands of these snails before and never find something comparable before. And so we repeated the experiment once, twice and even a third time. Jörg discovered that 10% of the females presented significant sexual deformations and that their egg production was four times normal. This uterus with the two glands is considerably larger in an um, super female compared with a normal female. And this specific specimen, um, in addition, exhibits this great rupture of the oviduct. You can imagine the power of the egg masses which have caused this rupture. It's, it's, it's really like a, um, an eruption of a volcano. Jörg asked, where is the bisphenol A found? The answer is, in our plastics. This antioxidant is added to babies' bottles, bottles in general, and packaging, but it also escapes. I was really shocked because um, you have to imagine these are test concentrations which can be found in every surface water and it is hard to believe, I confess, that at these very low environmentally relevant concentrations such harmful effects like a killing of the females is induced. The scientists are only beginning to discover that the plastics in the oceans release chemical substances into the environment which have effects that are still unknown. How much escapes once the products are in the water? How do these pollutants accumulate in the food chain? Are marine animals affected? And to what extent? Denis? Oui. À trois heures. That's what the crew of the World Wildlife Fund have been trying to find out by studying the Mediterranean fin whale, the world's second largest whale. To know if these animals are contaminated, the scientists needed to study fat samples. Biopsy succeeded. The results of the biopsies are clear. Just like polar bears and Atlantic whales, the fin whale's fat contains fire retardants, which are additives to plastic. Ah, yes. No one yet knows what effect these products have on the species. Nice. Here we are in the middle of nowhere, miles from any continent, and we find substances and pollutants that have no business being here, which were produced hundreds of miles away and have been carried here by the current. What bothers me most is that we're contaminating the whole planet, including the remotest and wildest places. Shocked by his own discoveries, Jorg wondered if the food wrapped in plastic that we eat every day were contaminated by certain substances. So he put some more snails in bottles of water for four to eight weeks. Those snails which were kept in PET bottles produced much more embryos compared to those snails in the glass bottles. Um, there are compounds in the plastic material in these PET bottles that leach into the culture medium of the snails. We do not know which compounds, we haven't 
um, identified them um, yet, but uh, they are clearly estrogenic. You have to realize, when we want to put a material or substance on the market, it undergoes laboratory testing, which enables us to show it's harmless. The results are passed on to scientific and public organizations, who decide whether or not we are allowed to commercialize it, and the authorities are constantly checking all the products that we sell. Is man also affected by these chemical products? Nicolas and Aurore, a couple who use plastic like everyone else, have agreed to have blood tests. Shana Swan is an epidemiologist. For years, she has been carrying out tests on fertility. In 2005, she started studying the effects of phthalates, another chemical additive for plastics. She selected women with a high level of phthalates in their urine and studied the effect on their infant male children. No one had done this before. These phthalates, uh, particularly the ones of most concern, are called anti-androgens. They lower testosterone. They do it actually to adults as well, and, um, but it's more important when it happens in the womb because the changes that occur in the womb are then permanent for life. And so because it's anti-androgenic, lower testosterone at the critical time will alter the path of development of the male genitalia. So normally it starts in a feminine default, if you will, and then becomes masculinized under the influence of testosterone. And that process is interfered with by certain phthalates um, when they get to a certain level. Phthalates are used in food packaging and toys, for example, to soften the plastic. But in rodents, they feminize the species. The testicles disappear and the penis becomes shorter. The distance between the testicles and the anus, which is normally double in males, shrinks and becomes more like that of females. Shanna had the idea and the courage to try taking the same measurements with human babies and got the same results. Okay, can you roll it in a little bit? When levels of DEHP, the most considered the most toxic phthalate, were higher in the mother's urine, then the boys were more likely to have testicles that were not completely descended into the scrotum and tended to have a significantly smaller penis. So I wouldn't, um, even as an ecotoxicologist and not as a specialist for human toxicology, I wouldn't expect negative impacts on adults. So if adults are using mineral water for, from PET bottles, there's absolutely no danger. But I, I'm not so convinced uh, when we're talking about pregnant women or very young children. Um, because in these very sensitive phases of the life cycle, um, care should be taken to avoid any um, estrogenic chemicals. You see, plastics contain substances that can eventually migrate, but only in infinitesimal quantities, which are below, well below the norms. Certain scientists use operating procedures that are unjustified. These arouse emotions, which are then regrettably picked up by the media, and it creates unfounded scares among the public at large. But after all, this is a democracy, so everyone has a right to express themselves. Is it a case of scaremongering scientists, or are they simply asking new questions? Nicolas and Aurore hear the results of their blood test for bisphenol A, a chemical component of plastic. By and large, those two people are just like you or me. 
It's like background noise. But that background noise, however, means we all have bisphenol A in our bodies now. As you know, this is a product that didn't exist before. Our grandparents didn't have any. It's a chemical product created by industry, and now we're all impregnated with it. No epidemiological study of this type has been carried out in France, but everyone tested in the United States had not only bisphenol A, but also phthalates in their body. In spite of the ocean pollution and the effect on animals, in spite of the contamination of our own bodies, man has not yet decided to do without plastic. On the contrary, production has been increasing by 10% a year. In India, plastic use is 20 times less than in Europe and the United States. But with a billion inhabitants, it will soon be one of the planet's three biggest consumers. How can this country stop polluting its rivers and coasts with its plastics? How can it go on absorbing our waste? Plastic, the indispensable ally of our everyday life. We thought it was an inert substance. Over a century, we have poured at least 100 million tons of it into the oceans. But now a boomerang effect is taking place. The situation is hopeless. It is getting worse at a near exponential rate and shows no sign of decreasing. No one seems to be able to envision a future without plastic and no one seems to be willing to admit that change needed to get rid of the plastic pollution problem is drastic. Incremental change, small changes, will not make a difference. Marcus and Anna refuse to give up. Thank you for coming here today. This is our Marine Debris Awareness Day. My name is Dr. Marcus Harris. Wherever they go, they keep up their struggle to change laws and mentalities and finally put an end to the plastic age. We can't change people's attitudes unless we scare them. Maybe we should tell them the world will explode because of all this waste. I've been around for a long time. I, I work, I might pollute the ocean, feel like it feels better now, it works for me, so I don't think we should change. I think we should just 